Hi, I'm Nicholas Preeby at the University of Texas at Austin, and today we're going to be talking about some of the highlights from a recent project between the Zillman Lab and my lab that's been published in Neuron. Both of our labs are really interested in the roles that excitatory and inhibitory neurons play in performing computations in the brain. We have focused our efforts on visual cortex, where we know some of the computations that are being performed. The particular computation that we study in this project is the integration of input from the right and the left eyes. Now this integration occurs in primary visual cortex initially, and it forms the basis of our perception of the world in three dimensions. Binocularity is a property of even neurons that provides us information about depth of objects in the world. Because of the difference in position of the two eyes in the head, each eye has a slightly different viewpoint. Depending on where the stimulus is located, there will be a spatial offset between the two retinal images. This offset is what we call disparity. For example, when the stimulus is at the preferred viewing distance, the left eye retinal image is the same as the one for the right eye. But as the stimulus moves away from this point, there is a certain phase difference between the two eye images. And this phase difference, or binocular disparity, changes with distance from the viewer. So disparity signal can be used to estimate depth of objects. Even neurons are known to be selective for binocular disparity. Both our labs and others have found disparity selectivity in even of mice, primates, and some other carnivores. Control the stimulus shown to each eye separately. So we place this mirror in front of the animal, uh, and stim uh, the stimulus from this monitor will go in the contralateral eye, and stimulus from this monitor goes towards this eye. So we can now separately control the spatial phase of each uh, of the stimulus presented to the left eye versus the right eye. This video is showing the fluorescence calcium responses from one focal plane. The left image is showing the activity from a small group of cells. The white dot at the top left comes on when the stimulus is on, and the condition is shown in the bottom left corner. You can see the raw fluorescence from one of these cells in the bottom right trace. This also happens to be a PV neuron since it is labeled under both the red and the green channels, shown in the static image on the top left. These raw fluorescence traces are then processed across each condition to give the average response for each condition per cell, shown in this figure. We have used two metrics to compare these responses. Ocular dominance index compares the responses across the two monocular conditions, while the disparity selectivity index measures the response modulation across the eight binocular conditions. I'm Benjamin Scholl, and I'm going to tell you about the response properties of PV and non-PV cells. Merging the calcium indicator and PV marker, we identified which cells are PV positive and which are PV negative. For ocular dominance, non-PV cells were either monocular or biased for the contralateral eye, while PV cells were strongly binocular. Non-PV cells were selective for disparity, while PV cells were unselective and unmodulated by disparity. We next explored the relationship between individual PV cells and their neighbors. Here is an individual PV cell and surrounding population, with each neuron color-coded for ocular preference. We then examined local populations at increasing distances from PV cells. We found a strong correlation between population average and individual PV cell ocular dominance for the closest neighbors. Expanding outwards, this relationship was less pronounced, becoming non-existent at 100 microns distance. Interestingly, we did not observe this spatial relationship for non-PV neurons. For disparity preference, we found a very similar spatial relationship, but only in PV cells. Simply, individual PV cells share selectivity with neighboring neurons no more than 100 microns away. In the mouse, what we find is that there's a functional organization that exists that we would call an organization of salt and pepper, or disarray. And that is that each one of the neurons uh, in, in, uh, across the surface of the mouse visual cortex is selected for a different um, uh, stimulus feature. So I've drawn this here by color. What I'm saying is each one of these different marks indicates a different neuron, and its preference for stimulus feature is indicated by color. In this case, in the mouse, we can see that all of this is a jumble, it's in disarray. And um, if we were to then imagine that there was a parvalbumin positive inhibitory neuron that was simply integrating the inputs within this local neighborhood, uh, it would actually respond to all of these different features 
there's a green cell within here, there's an orange cell, a red, and a blue cell. So it actually wouldn't be at what we would call a tuned cell or a selected cell. We would call it an untuned cell because it's integrating the inputs from its local neighborhood, and that local neighborhood is diverse. In contrast to that, in primates and carnivores, there's actually a mapping that exists for stimulus selectivity across the surface of uh, the visual cortex. That is, the cells that say, like, the green stimulus are over here, and the blue stimulus are over here, the red and the orange stimulus are segregated. And that means that if there were a provodinum positive cell, say, in this position right here, and it's integrating the local input, um, then it would actually be a selective response. It would be a tuned cell because it would respond to the orange stimulus very well, it might respond weakly to the red stimulus, but it shouldn't respond to the green or the blue stimulus. So this is a, this is a major prediction of our study, and that is that if there is a map that exists a, across uh, the, the, the cortical structure, then you should see that in the selectivity of the cell. If, the, uh, if there's no map across uh, the cortex, then you should integrate all these inputs. There should be sort of disarray, and you would get this untuned uh, response. And this may be a major difference that exists between rodents and carnivores and primates.